eternal God who speaks eternal words that will never fade away. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We honor you. Let your will be accomplished for our gathering this morning. Be magnified. Be glorified in the midst of the saints. And to you be glory in the church, both now and evermore, Father. Amen. was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. 
who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us and we saw his glory glory as of the only begotten from the father full of grace and truth John testified about him and cried out saying this was he of whom I said he who comes after me has a higher rank than I for he existed before me for of his fullness we have all received and and grace upon grace for the law was given through Moses grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ no one has seen God at any time the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father he has explained to him you may be seated I would just like to share a few points from this chapter, John chapter 1. I just love this book. The Bible says in verse 1, in the beginning. Now, when was the beginning? Because we know that God is an eternal God. So when was the beginning? In Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So we can take it that the beginning is at the time creation was called into being. So that's what it refers to as the beginning when the world was created. But up until that point, God and his word existed way before. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Hey, the word was actually God. So that's what it says. So God and his word are one. And so should we be one with God's word. The word we speak must match the lifestyle we live. In... Um, Ezekiel, Ezekiel ate the scroll. You know, the Bible says, uh, it was instructed, eat the scroll, which is the law. And he ate the scroll, and you know that it says, you are what you eat. And so there should be no discrepancy with the word of God that we are eating and the life that we live in. I love verse 3. It says, all things came into being through the word. So everything that was made, the Bible says, was made because of the utterance of the word. Don't we want things to spring forth in our lives? There's much that I want God, just Lord, spring forth that, cause that to bloom, cause that to blossom. But you know what? The word has to be embedded in there first. If you want a plant to bear fruit, you first have to plant the seed into soil. You can't just get the apple tree and pick apples of the apple tree. There has to be a seed of apple planted into the soil. So if we want things to sprout and to spring forth in our lives, we have to have the word embedded in us because all things are made by him. All things come forth from him once the word is in you. And then verse 6, I love, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Put your name there. There was a woman sent from God whose name was Rona. There was a man sent from God whose name was Leith. Right, put your name there. What was he sent for? To testify and to be a witness of the light of Christ so that many would believe. Many would believe. And so that is our reason on earth, that we be a witness and say, believe on God. How can I believe, Renee? I need to see something. Okay, see the light of God in me. So we have to be, and it brings us to verse 8. He was not the light but testified of the light. John admitted, it's not about me. I'm not the light, but I'm going to testify of the light. You can only radiate light. Um, you know that the moon doesn't have light of its own. It reflects the rays of the sun. It has no light. We don't have light of our own. We can only reflect the light of Christ. So always remember, it's not about us, but we are witness to reflect his life. So it's not about our own personal agenda. It's all about him. In verse 12, we have a right to be called the sons of God. In verse 12, it says, To as many as received him, to them gave he power to be sons of God or children of God. We have a right to be called sons of God. So don't accept the labels that other people place on you based upon their perception of you. People perceive you in different ways. They undermine you. They may undermine your self-worth or your self-image. Don't accept those labels. If God says, if you receive me, you have a right to be called my son. So walk in your sonship. Walk with your head, head held high. I am a son of God. And when labels are thrown on you, you know the label on your forehead says son. So walk in confidence of who you are. And then in verse 14, it says, uh, glory, grace, and truth is only seen when the word becomes flesh. So Christ Jesus, the word, 
He came to earth and he fleshed out. What you hear about me in my word, watch me the word walking amongst you. When you live the word and you walk the word in your life, truth is going to be seen, glory is going to be seen, grace is going to be seen, only when the word is in you. Verse 16, I love and I want to end off with this. Of his fullness we have received, grace upon grace. And now you know that a measure of grace is always allotted to us to enable us to go through processes. There's many sufferings in life, processes, trials and tribulations. We can only get through that by the grace of God, which is God's empowerment. And sometimes we allotted grace to go through a circumstance. And don't you feel grace is running out? Like you feel, I'm starting to feel a little bit weak now. I feel like, how much more can I be? I know God's grace is working in my life, but how much more can I be? And then you know what God says? Your grace is going low. Tops it up. Grace upon grace, another load. And you know what image I get? You know a tractor that has an excavation tractor. When it goes and it excavates a whole lump of sand, and you know those, I don't know what that thing is called, that mouth of it, and it goes forward, goes forward, and it just tops it over and all that sand falls out. Then it goes back and it digs up more sand and it, it you know, pours it out. And that's the image I get. God is telling me, Renee, when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling low, when you feel, can I go on God? I know your grace is enabling me and I'm, I'm standing on your word. But sometimes I do feel weak because we are human. God says, don't worry. Watch out for my next topping of grace. He comes and he offloads. I'm going to give you grace upon grace, which tops up the grace you have. And that's the God we have. It's a grace upon grace God. You can never fall short of grace. You can never fall short of grace. So when you're feeling weak, no, God, I'm ready for that next download of grace. And God is faithful. He says grace upon grace. So this chapter in one, in a nutshell, it speaks about God and his word are one. There's no differentiation. In the beginning was God before time began. He was the Word. The Word was with Him. The Word was Him. The Word is with you. You are the Word. And God wants you to be one with the Word where you live out a lifestyle. There must be no differentiation between the Word in you and the Word that you live. You know the nutrients in food. We can say, wow, that green juice is healthy. Or that liver is full of iron. It's healthy. But unless you ingest it and let it digest then you feel the effects of the nutrients. The word is good. The word is powerful. The word can transform your life unless you ingest it and make it become part of you. Um, you won't see the effects of the word. So I want to encourage you today. You are the word made flesh. Go out and represent him well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, God. We thank you for the power of your word. You and your word are one, God. And we pray, Lord, that we become one with your word, that even as we receive your word, God, and we apply it to our lives and we flesh it out, that your glory, your grace, your truth will be seen through us. Father, may we ra radiate in you was life and the life was the light of men. May the life of God in us radiate light, your light to others, that many may come in. Many are dying, God. Many are, are ailing. Many are, are going down, Lord, and, and are falling apart. But God, may the light we share and impact them, save them, God, and bring them into your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that you are the only true word. We love you, God. We love the power of your word. We stand on your word. We live by your word. Your words are life. Your words are truth. Your words are grace. And we bless you, God. Jesus Christ, the word made flesh amongst us. We bless you for the powerful.
think of what you will wear, what you will drink, what you will eat. The Gentiles seek these things, he said. The world seeks these things. They pursue provision. They pursue materiality. And he said, your father knows that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things, what you eat, what you drink, what you shall wear, these things shall be added Keep your hands. I just sense there's a great addition happening even as we're singing these songs. God is adding things as you seek first the kingdom. God is adding things as you trust in the provision as the son of God of your heavenly father. Father, we release provision. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your voice. Just pray. We release your provision. Oh, the kindness of our father's heart releases provision. Answers to prayer, Father. It, God. Let it flow. Oh, let it flow. Let your provision flow. Let your provision flow. Let your provision flow, God. Oh, let it flow. Let your mercy flow. Let breakthrough flow. Let your favor flow to this house. In the name of Jesus. Receive it from the hand of our Father. Oh, our Father, every good, every perfect gift comes from you, Father of lights, the giver of good gifts, whom there's no shadow of turning, neither variables. So, everything I need, everything I need, my Father has it. My
filling of the Holy Ghost. It's a sense we need to do that now. Um, everything we need is locked up. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit a spirit of supply. When David said, uh, take not your good spirit or your steadfast spirit, the Hebrew word there means generous. In other words, plenitude, plentiful. He is not, God doesn't deliver him in, in small uh, doses. Jesus had the spirit without without measure everyone say a generous spirit you think of the holy spirit you think of a generous spirit is is he doesn't just want to fill you to overflowing um, but his generosity will then be expressed in and through your being everyone just close your eyes and just lift up your hands take not your good spirit away from us take not your your holy spirit away from us i want you just to lift our hands and say god fill me with your holy spirit baptize me with your holy spirit of grace Fill me with overflowing. Come on. Let the Holy Ghost just bubble up and well within you. So open up your mouth and you can, for those of you that speak in other tongues, just begin to worship the Lord in your heavenly language. Just begin to magnify Him. Come Holy Spirit. Come and fill us. Come and fill us. Be baptized. Receive the Holy Ghost Church. Receive a new expression of His infilling and His love and His provision and His bounty and His fullness of His fullness. We receive grace upon grace. Come on, grace upon grace. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, Come on, receive, receive. Lift both hands to the Lord, Amen. Amen. There's a corporate grace here present. There's a strong corporate grace present, not only for oneness, because the Holy Spirit, like I taught, is a spirit of oneness. The Bible speaks about the oneness of the Spirit in the bonds of of peace. And I don't want just my provision to be experienced. I want your provision as well. I seek your infilling of the Holy Spirit as well. And so I'm going to ask God for something very special this morning. I want to ask Him just to baptize the house afresh with renewed vigor, with renewed expectation. And it comes really from the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, be full with the Spirit. And the, in, the, in the Greek tense, it's present continuous. You don't get full once at one point in time. It's a continuous filling. It's an ever uh, reoccurring thing and I just want to encourage you you're feeling stale you're feeling dejected you're feeling 
like you've spent, maybe burned out, run out by activity, pressures of life. Or maybe you've just neglected aspects of your prayer life, your Bible reading. And you feel somewhat dry internally. God the Holy Ghost is here. And I tell you, as your leader, he wants to just reawaken and reactivate some dead things within you. Some of you struggle to read the Bible. Some of you struggle to pray. But when the Holy Ghost is present within you, he drives these things. The Bible says praying in the, in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I want to just ask God, lift your hands to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, O oh God, that you baptize us as a corporate house with a fresh baptism of your Holy Spirit. Pour on this house of David the Spirit of grace and supplication. Pour on this house of David the Spirit of grace and supplication. Pour your Spirit out, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Come on, lift your voice and worship Him. Lift your voice and just magnify Him. Open wide your mouth and glorify Him. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, Come on, worship me, worship me. Come on, cry out to your father. Cry out to your father to fill you. Thank you, Thank you, Father. Yes, we receive. We receive your spirit, Father. Great is your mercy toward me. Your loving kindness toward me, your tender mercies I see day after day. receive the offering in this environment receive the offering I want you to give as your father would give amen amen so give as your father would give great is your mercy towards me your loving kindness for me 
morning family such a joy to be in the house of the Lord amen well this morning we want to warmly welcome you the house and all of you who are joining us via the live stream uh, for our Sunday morning service may the Lord bless you this morning um, before we begin we'd like to welcome our visitors if there are any of you who are joining us with the for the first time I don't have any cards please could you stand if you're joining us for the first time we'd like to give you a warm Gentlemen at the back, Warm Gate Ministries, Durban Central, welcome. Bless you both. May you be blessed this morning. This is your father's house. You may be seated. The announcements for the week are as follows. On Wednesday, we have our house church meetings via Zoom, and that's at 7 p.m. Um, and the focus of that discussion will be today's teaching by Pastor Randolph. So please review the teaching even before you get the notes. Re-listen to the YouTube stream. Uh, and then just feel free to share on Wednesday uh, your thoughts and insights to the house church group. I know we, we are very refreshed on a Wednesday uh, by listening to all that everyone has to share, and especially the testimonies of how the Word of God has been active and present in their lives. On Friday morning, we meet again for a weekly prayer meeting, and that is from 5.30 a.m. to 6. Um, and then on Saturday morning, we have a special meeting at Miracle Ministries in Wentworth. Pastor Randolph will be the guest speaker there, uh, and I'd like to encourage you. We spoke to the organizers of the event, and they asked us to submit names early for catering purposes. However, I know due to work situations and stuff, not everyone could have confirmed, but there's still an opportunity to submit your name, so please just do so on our men's group or contact me directly, and we, we can inform them of um, your registration. All right. Then uh, the next announcement we have is the blanket drive. Uh, so, you know, once a year, the church, Gate Ministries Durban Central, embarks on uh, a community outreach program, uh, and it's usually a blanket drive. So, um, this year in winter, we're going to be handing out blankets. Uh, so, please feel free to uh, give freely towards this cause, this initiative, uh, so that we as a house can be represented in the earth as those who, who made changes in people's lives, who brought healing uh, let us live up to the mandate of this house. And we're doing it with a very simple thing. So just whatever you can, please donate towards the account. Uh, and just remember, it's the same church account, but you just have to reference it, blanket or blanket drive. All right. Then we have a few conferences that are coming up. The first one is on uh, from the 1st to the 3rd of May, which is in Port Shepston. Uh, this conference is hosted by Gate Ministries Port Shepston under the leadership of Pastor Reggie John. And the guest speaker there is Pastor Tamo Naidu. So please... Registration is free, uh, but it is compulsory just for the numbers and catering purposes. Wednesday is a public holiday, so for those of you who can make it outside of work time, please, please do so and support that event. Uh, other than that, registration is compulsory. 
Um, yeah, if you would like to attend, we will be sending a link uh, to the church group. Um, they have a, a Google sheet where they're just recording names to, for numbers, and et cetera, but that will be sent out to the, the church group later. All right, then the next one is um, the ALS, Apostolic Leadership Summit, which will be held in Gate Ministries, Santon, uh, and um, hosted by Pastor Thamo. So if you also plan on attending that one, that's, I think, a Friday to a Sunday. So please just, uh, the link will be shared on the church group, and you can register via that on their platform. Uh, yeah, and that's it for the week. So we would also like to wish the following people who celebrated their birthdays this past week a very happy birthday to Kaylin, uh, Carolyn, Kiana, and Gemma, whose birthday is today. We want to wish you a very happy birthday, and may the Lord continue to richly bless you. We're now going to welcome Pastor Randolph, who will be sharing the Word of God with us. Bless you. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Amen. It's wonderful to, to be with you this morning. Amen. The kids are going to be dismissed for Children's Church. Alika will be uh, teaching you. Thank you, Alika, for your prep, so your lesson plan. Wonderful. The kids are in for a great time of impartation. Amen. Wonderful to hear the sound of children. In the house, amen. Everyone say it's family. family. No children, you must get worried. Um, our daughter's in matric. She might be gone soon. And there'll be no sounds in the house of anything little. <laughs> Maybe we should work on something else. <laughs> She's saying, be happy with your grandchildren. <laughs> amen. Ray had a matric ball last night, matric dance. It was a lovely affair. Uh, went off very, very well. And I um, want to congratulate Ray on that milestone in a journey in Christ in terms of our academic um, pathway. And um, we had a very late night, obviously. Um, but we're all good, all good to go by His grace in Christ. Amen. Um, I would greatly encourage those of you that were able to attend the Pochepson Conference, if not the entirety of the thing, at least for that Wednesday morning. Um, it's a public holiday, and so um, it'd be great if you can take time out to, to go. For those of you intent on attending the ALS, please let Renee and I know so we can see how best to travel and make a various arrangements. Um, we'll be going up just for the Friday and the Saturday and leaving immediately after the last session on the Saturday so we can be back in time for service here. Amen. Amen. We all good? Sound good? Amen. Well, I'm going to continue today on speaking on the spirit of, of prayer. And this is session 19. I want to speak specifically on something very, very important. And I've entitled this, A Forgiving Heart enhances prayer. A forgiving heart enhances prayer. Um, towards the end of the service, I'm going to introduce some new families, so we're going to do that at the end. So please just hang around for that. Um, this issue in reference to prayer is probably, for me, one of the most important matters when you speak about the theology of prayer. If ever you want to enhance your prayer life and grow in this dynamic, then you must always ensure that when you pray, you pray from the platform of a heart that is free from bitterness, anger, resentment, specifically unforgiveness. If there's any kind of relational tension unresolved in your heart and you still want to position yourself to pray, It'll be highly ineffective, and I'll show you the scriptures. We also dealt in some respect with this matter when we did the forgiveness series in COVID. But I want to go just probe, probe it a bit more deeply, because I see just in counseling people, in talking to people, and it's just my gentle observation that many people's prayer answers are being paused. Uh, God is keeping things back because people are praying with bitterness in the heart. 
people are praying with animosity in the heart. There are actually some people playing with, mal with malice in the heart, malicious intent. Malice, I discussed it in the forgiveness series quite intently. The definition of malice, if you're malicious, it means you seek the other's hurt. It is subtle revenge. You might not say you are revengeful. But if you wish the other does not succeed, that's malice. You don't have to be malicious where some people are overtly malicious, where they will strategize the demise of another, or they'll put roadblocks in the progress of another. You get some wicked people in the world. Now, that sort of thing does not befit a Christian or a son of, of God. I must always check my heart to see, especially against a so-called enemy of mine, or someone that really I don't get on with, or maybe even someone who is malicious towards me by all appearances and indications. I must check my own heart that I don't respond with the same spirit. Because if there's malice in the heart, the person is powerless in prayer. If there's malice and any kind of bitterness, uh, resentment, I resent you. They're very strong terms to use. And I've heard it in counseling. People say, the one will say to the other, I resent you now. In other words, I deem you detestable. You are an anathema to me. You're low class. You don't rank and feature in any kind of esteem in my priority, esteem. My value of you, I think zilch. I think nothing of you, right? And I want to very cautiously and very, very um, rather seriously caution you about this matter. This church is very strong on Hebronic principles. Very strong on principles of love. We love each other here. There's no one that should be here that should want the ill of another. There's no one in this house, if, it's just, if you're sitting here and you're wanting uh, or wishing ill intent on somebody, anybody in this house, I declare you illegal in this house. I will not tolerate that here. This house is where we love each other. This house is where if my, I'm not satisfied until my brother succeeds. Even if I know he doesn't fully appreciate me, and maybe there's tensions, subtle tensions, yet my heart towards him must be Christ-like. I have preached more on love, oneness, forgiveness. I have preached more on relational issues in this house more than on any other one singular topic. Right? And I expect by this time for all of us to excel in love, we must love each other deeply and sincerely with a true and sincere heart. When I'll show you, I might not get through everything here because of time, I'll show you from the scriptures that when you excel in love, actually your faith becomes enhanced and you need faith to pray, right? Faith without love does not work. In fact, the Bible says that faith works through love. If love is not matured, if the person still harboring uh, unsavory attitudes in reference to another, you can't then pray and have the requisite faith you want to move mountains, right? You've got to first move the mountain of unforgiveness in your heart before you move the mountain by faith in your path, right? You move mountains by faith, but if you fail to move a mountain of unforgiveness in your heart, the mountain in your path will still stay. Right? It's very important, these things. And I'm finding the more I excel relationally, the more my faith content grows. Because faith works through love. Everyone say it, faith works through love. Yeah, I think it's Galatians 2 or 3. I'll get to the scriptures in a moment. But let me just say this. Let me just introduce the topic. I taught last week that um, if you harbor any kind of sin in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. Not so? So harboring sin um, closes the ear of God to you. It taught you that you mustn't pray for what you should obey for. So sometimes you would obey a thing so that prayer then becomes more effective. Okay? Disobedience is sin. So if my people which are called by 
my name, will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face and pray. Then I will hear from heaven. Then I will heal their land. But my people got wicked ways. That's an amazing text. If God says, my people got wicked ways. And he says, if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, turn from the wicked ways that my people got. Now you can't be called God people, God's people, God's son, and have wicked ways. What did David pray? Search me, Psalm 139, the last verse. Search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You might sit there and say, Rand of the sermon does not apply to me. I don't think I'm a wicked person, person at all. You are here and the sermon is for you. <laughs> right? There are some wicked ways in you that need to be searched out. There's some wicked ways in you that need to be spotlighted. God is saying, I will show you, I will show you your own wickedness. Yet you are called my people. And that verse in 2 Chronicles says, if my people called by my nature, my name, my character, turn, humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. One of the wicked ways of God's people is unforgiveness. One of the great detestable things about so-called sons of God is this uncanny, this is my observation, there is an uncanny propensity to harbor resentment. Now you might not be over the top resentment. You might not be over the top wicked. You might not be um, flagrantly um, resentful of people. You might say, Randolph, I'm not wishing anybody's hurt. I don't wish for anybody to, to fail. But I know that this message is for this house this morning. If there is any residual, the Lord says He wants to search the house. A scanning. Um, I'm watching this documentary on Netflix about the oceans being drained. If you've seen it, on, it's a National Geographic thing. It's, it's a series, a few episodes. I'm more interested in the war parts of the episode where they, they'll drain the Baltic Sea through modern technology using computers. And they're able to find shipwrecks and lost uh, submarines and U-boats and uh, warships, etc., through various battles, and they're able to decipher what actually went wrong in a specific battle. You should watch it. It's a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous series to watch. Now, some things are buried until they are drained. Some things remain covered for so long. I mean, um, when was the war? 1945. Right? We're in the year 20, almost 2024 20, now. Work out the mess. Right? More than 80 or more years ago, uh, we're now discovering what went wrong, but it's been buried for years. And through laser sonar technology, um, these um, scientists are able to drain literally most seas. Not all seas, some seas are just too deep, but most can be, can be like the Mediterranean, the Baltic, the Gulf of Mexico. I watched the program the other day. Um, was just done, I was able to look at some of the uh, battles fought by pirates, pirate ships, etc. Some of the privateers, for those of you who know what a privateer is in that era, if you're historically minded, <laughs> okay. And I was amazed how a secret buried for years in 2024 is uncovered. Right? And I'm saying to you, this is a word from the Lord. Remember I said to you last week, be transparent. Don't hide anything. Because God is draining the waters that cover the thing that you're trying to bury. Right? Because God wants to heal. Remember, whatever God reveals, He heals. God doesn't expose to embarrass. Repeat this after me. He never exposes to embarrass. He always reveals to heal. Right? God is, doesn't want to embarrass anybody. But because he, love you, he loves you, he will unearth the thing that you try to bury. Because he wants you to grow. He wants your betterment. He wants to answer your prayers. So he will reveal the thing. And one thing I know God has asked me to stress in this morning's meeting is that there are some people sitting with too much resentment. Your heart has become hard 
You might not call yourself a hater of men, but there's a thing in you by which you cannot love fully. If you cannot love fully, it means there is a segment of hate, resentment. It's very, very subtle, you know. Um, you might not say, and some of you love politically or religiously or spiritually correct. You want to be spiritually correct so you, uh, you love because you've got no option. Well, God, I love you. And I love the one that hates me. But I love them with the love of the Lord. <laughs> you know we say. <laughs> you know? In other words, me. If it was left to me, I would not. But because your Bible requires, because I know, th- please remember this. Some people think like this. If I don't love the person, I'm going to face the ill consequences of God's disfavor. So the word says love, therefore I have to love. So I'll position myself spiritually correct. I will love for fear of the consequences of not loving. Then I lose favor with God. That for me is not acceptable. You must never obey God out of the fear of the consequences of your disobedience. Sila. Never obey God out of the fear of the consequences of disobeying Him. I don't tithe because I want to withhold the devourer. If, if I don't tithe, the devourer attacks me according to Malachi 3. I tithe to honor God. I tithe because I love God. I tithe because I want to please God. I don't not withhold the tithe because I don't want the devourer to attack me. That's just... A, a by the way, a by the way blessing. So the negative consequences of disobedience to anything God has commanded you must not be the primary motivation for you to obey Him. I don't obey to escape judgment. I obey because I love God. I obey because of my representation of Him. I want to represent Christ. right? And I want to encourage all of you. I hear the Lord saying to you, do you love as you should? Because the excellence of your love is going to fuel the power of your prayer. Right? The excellence of your love is going to fuel the power of your, your prayer. Now, I've got many scriptures here. I'm going to leave out some simply because of, 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 of time. I wrote in my notes, forgiving, forgiveness of others is key to ensuring that we live ourselves within the context of being forgiven. If I forgive others, I live in a space called I am forgiven, right? It's very, very important that you understand this. So that um, sin would not prevent God from hearing my prayers. Who wants God not to hear your prayers? Nobody here, right? We want God to hear our prayers. So I must live in a space called forgiven. Everyone say forgiven. Because if I'm forgiven, there's nothing hindering me from relating to him. Yet the scripture says, if I don't forgive my brother, God will not forgive me. So not forgiving completely and fully disadvantages me and relegates me to a place where God will not forgive me. Or you look with disfavor upon everything I do. And I don't want to be in that zone. I don't want to be in a zone called unfavored by God, disfavored by God, unforgiven by God, okay? Because that for me is critical to, um, my forgiveness is critical to my being answered, my prayers being answered by God. It is pointless to pray with an unforgiving heart. You rather not pray and sort the issue out. It is totally vainglory, empty to pray. You want to, you see, then prayer becomes for you a religious activity and not a righteous activity. Prayer must not be a religious activity. It must be a righteous activity. Right? So some people pray religiously, and you think by the act of your praying, never mind the condition of your heart, that God smiles upon you. This will not, not, not cut it with God. Right? Now, let's look at a few scriptures. 1 John 4.20 1 John 4.20. I don't have the text here, so if you can bring it up for me, um, uh, please, Gary. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, 
He is a liar. Any liars in the house? <laughs> no, not here. Talking to the live stream. <laughs> For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God. It doesn't, it, the word cannot means cannot. The, heart, the impossibility of loving God that is invisible if you hate your brother who is visible. So if you say to your brother, I hate you, you are saying to me, I have an incapacity to love God, right? So it's all your vertical uh, relationship with God. It's going to be dependent on how you relate to men horizontally, okay? You must get this principle firmly embedded in your life. I wrote this in my notes. Your standing before God is determined by your attitude towards men. You're standing before God, how, I, how God interfaces with Randolph. He will determine that by how Randolph interfaces with men. God says to Randolph, I want to check how you relate to men because on that basis, I'll, that will determine the frequency by which I relate to, I relate to you. Matthew 5 verse 23, you know this very well. Matthew 5 23 says the following. It speaks about bringing your gift to the altar. Now, if you bring your, your gift, let's say for our purposes, an offering, a financial offering, Matthew 5 and 23. If you are presenting your offering, everyone say the altar. Publicly, an altar is where heaven engages earth. Altars in the Bible are meeting places of heaven and earth. Men but built altars of sacrifice. For example, in Elijah's day, God would send fire on the altar. The altar was the point of contact where heaven meets earth. Prayer, so-called, is an altar. When I pray, I want heaven's will to be done in earth. Prayer is that point that pulls heaven down. So when you read altar, you, I always, when I read altar in the Bible, I always think heaven meeting earth. God's will superimposing itself on earth's reality. So if you are presenting your offering at the altar, at the place where heaven meets earth, and you remember your brother has something against you, what must you do? Leave the offering. Don't carry on offering at the place where heaven meets earth. You'd rather leave the offering there and everyone say this loud. Say, first be reconciled. First. Come on, say it like first is a priority. Say, first be reconciled. First. And we are an apostolic church, and anything first is apostolic. He said some in the church, first apostles. If you are apostolic, there are certain priorities that you must do first. Don't go ahead at the altar trying to get heaven to respond to earth, when at the back of your mind, you know you don't have anything against your brother, but your brother has something against you. That's how serious Jesus puts this. You are the innocent person. I wish it was the other way around. God, why are you making it so difficult for us? Huh? It says, the brother has something against you, but you are aware of it. God says, what ranks more highly on my agenda is not, I'm not impressed by an offering. Whether it's 10 million rand that you're giving into the church account, which you must do if you have. Right? <laughs> God says, I'm not impressed by that. That means nothing to me if you do that in the context of accommodating relational tension. God says, your reconciliation with your brother will speak more loudly to me than the 10 million rand. Right? But I like what it says, leave the offering at the altar. <laughs> Don't take it with you. Come back. <laughs> Everyone say, come back. <laughs> He says, leave the offering at the altar lest you get ideas while you're going to your brother. Right? Go first be reconciled to your brother. Then come and present your... And then, and this is why I believe the next phase of blessing financially on this house and in other houses globally, um, when you sow, you will always reap. You sow seed, you will reap. But I believe there's a reaping and a harvest that's going to come to seed sowing or offering is given based upon the context of relational rightness, of love, of reconciliation, right? 
I've reached out to men and women over the years that have had issues with me or both of us. We've bent over backwards because we know the principle. Okay, We are innocent, but God, that person is not at peace with us. They are not at peace. We can go on with our lives and we can surmise and say, none of my business, their problem. God says, no, it's your priority. If you are my son, sort these you out. Then come and see how a blessing will hit your offering on that altar. And then all of heaven opens up. I have a long teaching on this, and we may redo it later. Where the next phase of financial blessing is going to be built upon relational maturity. Okay, so an altar is this place. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 9b. I definitely won't finish this thing. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9b says the following. Pray then in this way. You know the so-called famous Our Father? Jesus taught us to pray. He said, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Everyone say, give us. Look at the next verse. Forgive us. Everyone say, forgive us. So give us, forgive us. Everyone say, give us, forgive us. Say it again. Give us, forgive us. Give us, forgive us. Come on. <laughs> give us, forgive us. Somebody can make a rap with this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then he says, you're going to forgive us how? Right? Forgive us of our debts as, everyone say, as we. In the same manner, according to the same frequency by which we also have forgiven our debtors. You are saying to God, you must forgive me in the same manner that I forgive others. So give, you cannot pray, give me, without also praying, forgive me. Give us, forgive us. And you cannot say, forgive us, if I haven't forgiven them. You cannot say then, just to, to round this up, you cannot say, give me, without also saying, I forgive them. Because you give me based upon how I forgive them. That's how you forgive me. And I'm in right standing with you. Then I can give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. We just want give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Most people's prayers are give me. Do this. Give me, give me, give me. My name is Jimmy. Give me, give me, give me God. Let it be downward. But I have no responsibility to men. If you analyze the prayer, the prayer is first. Yes, God, give me daily bread, which I will show you next week is not daily provision. Something else. But let's just summarize the point. You, your, your prayer of give me is rooted, it gets power when it's based upon the fact that you are forgiven, which itself is based upon how you have forgiven others. Okay? Does anybody have any enemies here? Oh, my, my limbs up. I have many. Right? For those of you who think you don't, a revelation, you have. Not everybody likes you. You might think you're the most likable soul under the heavens. Right? I can't understand why people hate me. It's like they must need a revelation. <laughs> yeah? I want to encourage you. You might think that everybody should favor you, but there are people that are for, like, written by jealousy, uh, envy, whichever, that simply want your demise. And then, watch this, forgive us of our debtors as we also forgive our, our debts, as we forgive our, forgiven our debtors. Verse 13, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from, deliver us from evil, that's spiritual warfare. Everyone say spiritual warfare. I want to be delivered from evil. So, Forgiveness is the basis for deliverance from evil. When I forgive men, that's how God delivers me from evil. Right? Notice the prayer for deliverance from evil comes exactly after you have forgiven others. I have forgiven them. Now deliver me from deliver me from evil. So if evil besets you, and I get this impression in my spirit. Some of you are praying against some evil besetting you. And the answer to your problem is not in prayer, is not in fasting. The answer to your problem is forgive them. 
and God delivers you from your from your from your evil look at 11 mark 11 25 so just before we move there you can see here in the so-called lord's prayer in matthew 6 jesus in speaking and teaching about prayer factored in the need to forgive others if this is the everyone say the model prayer the so-called our father is the model prayer it's a standard prayer. It's the go-to prayer. If you take every line, it, it reveals principles for how the man who prays must pray effectively. And Jesus put in there, forgive them. So forgiveness makes prayer powerful. Because Jesus, in teaching about prayer, highlights the need to for, highlights the need to forgive. Uh, I just said some of you are going to walk out of this meeting and someone's going to upset you big time. But you're being prepared. Right? You must forgive the people in advance. I've got a credit. I'm in credit with my forgiveness capacity. Some of you in overdraft. Right? I'm in massive credit. I've even forgiven people for sins they're still going to commit against me. That hasn't happened yet, but even before it happens, you're forgiven, brother. No problem. Not an issue. You're forgiven. Right? So tell your neighbor, be in credit. Come on, be in credit. Because I don't want anything to hinder my prayer life. Yeah? We gave a financial offering to someone estranged from us on their birthday. It was quite significant. Why do we do things like this? And even though the person at that stage didn't want to reconcile with us, I wanted to keep my heart free. It wasn't a bribe. It wasn't a, 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 an attempt to, to woo the person. I wanted to demonstrate there's nothing in my heart against you. I've reached out. I wanted to reconcile. Here's a gift for you. Right? On your 60th. Bless you. Right? Look at this, this verse. This is an amazing verse. Spells it out plainly. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. Right? Whenever you stand praying, forgive. Now Jesus takes this issue of forgiveness and prayer very seriously. When you stand praying, forgive. If you have, now I like this, because it leaves... It, it, it covers all bases. Everyone say, anything, anything. Anyone. anyone. Now, isn't that including, yes. includes everything and anyone, right? Yes. So no one has an excuse to leave these doors and have a legal grudge against anybody. Your days of legal grudges are over. Your days of self-justification, why you're adopting your heart in calcitrogen position is over, declares the Lord. You can't have anything against anyone and come and pray to me, God says, I will not hear. When you stand praying, forgive anything against anyone. That anything covers that issue of which you are so hurt about. Anyone covers anyone. It covers your work colleagues, covers your spouse, covers your children, covers your parents, covers your extended family. Right? Covers your gym buddies, your leisure buddies, anything against anyone. When you drive to work tomorrow morning, just let us ring in your mind. Lord, anything against anyone, I just forgive. Left, right, and center. Anything, say it with me. Come on, anything, anything. against anyone. anyone. Say, I forgive. I forgive. Right? We must hear the stories at, at school. Right? If, you, if you have a child at school, at high school, they're full of stories. It goes on at school. It goes on at varsity. Huh? And all you learners and those of students at, at tertiary institutions, I say to you, anything against anyone, you just for. You mustn't be hard or unforgiving in your heart. You just say, I forgive you. And whatever you have done within your life. I'll speak to marriages in about two weeks. Because First Peter 3, 7 let me just maybe mention the point and go on. In 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, You husbands. And I like the way it's like, Yo, we are so hard. Why don't God just start the verse and say, Husbands? He says, You husbands. <laughs> it's like, Lord is so intent on addressing this. He says, You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. So I must understand, Renee. And there's no graduation date for this university. Right? This is a lifelong learning. Right? 
This is, you learn things daily. I must understand her, her makeup, what makes her tick, right? Understand her, right? Um, I, must, I must live with her in an understanding way as with someone weaker only physically, right? I think Renee is so much more stronger in so many dimensions than myself since she is a woman. Show her honor. Everyone say weigh her. Weigh her. What, how do you value her? What value do you ascribe to this woman? Uh, her dignity, her honor. Show her esteem as a fellow heir of grace. Because together, everyone say joint heir. Stand up. Say joint heir. So, so joint heir means together we access. Everyone say grace. grace. Okay, pull it down with me. Okay. <laughs> I cannot access grace individually if I'm married. Because in marriage, the text says we've become fellow participant, joint partakers of grace. If there's any like tension or unforgiveness at this level, the Bible says to the husband, you brother, your prayers are hindered. Because God puts the responsibility at the, at the feet of the husband in this verse. He says, unless you honor your wife. Now, I want all the men to do homework. I was a former teacher. I love giving homework. And if you don't do this homework, there will be detention. <laughs> I want you to, I want all the men, and I want to see it on the men's chat group. Let's talk amongst ourselves first. Don't show the ladies just yet. No? I want you to think of five ways you want to honor your wife. And I want to see your contributions on the chat group. Don't show the wife yet. Let's just do it ourselves. Make sure we, we find because I don't want any issues. <laughs> right. Think of five ways. When I say honor, how can I honor Renee? Show her respect. Live with her in an understanding way. What are the practical ways, things? I want the men to think of five things you're going to do. Right? Maybe in the next month you're going to plan this. Where Moira will be gobsmacked by the way uh, Evie honors her. Right? <laughs> See, there's faith for this. But I don't want this to be politically correct. Don't just do it, but let your heart be in it. You see, why must you do this? Say, we want our prayers heard. That's the thing. We want our prayers heard, God. When, when the husband prays as the head of the home, he wants heaven to flood. But the seed, one singular thing that prevents a husband's prayers being heard is when he does not value or see what his wife represents and her worth. Right? And so I'll just leave that there and come back to this in a special session later. Everyone say you husbands. If you're sitting next to them, him say you. <laughs> you husbands. Right? Hey. Okay, I'll not say. Let's leave certain things less. Luke 17 verse 1. Luke 17 verse 1. Watch this. I'll be quick here. He said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. A stumbling block is an offense. Somebody hurts you. Stumbling block. Uh, you're walking and like, you know, you stumble over something. It, it impedes your, your momentum, your smoothness of your, your process. A stumbling block can even prevent process. It can, like a, it can prevent your further movement. But woe to them through whom they come. So Jesus says, it's inevitable. Let me just say this. If you're living in this life, offenses are waiting for you at every turn. Some of you are going to work tomorrow and it'll be knocking at your door, right? Waiting for you. Right? Someone's going someone's gonna to make you angry somewhere, but your motto is anything, anyone. Say anything, anyone. I somehow just forgive. So, but Jesus is saying, this inevitable, expect this in life. It would be better for him, for that person who causes the stumbling block or the offense, if a millstone were hung around his neck and if he were thrown into, sea, into the sea, then he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. At that stage, the children were around Jesus. I really want to caution the house. You should not be the offending party. You should not breed offense. Now, I want to encourage us, especially to little kids. Don't put stumbling blocks in the way of the pathway of development of little children. Some things will stay with that child forever. 
because of your attitude. If you're going to be this loving person and a prayer warrior of notes, something you must master is I must not be an offender or breed unnecessary offenses. Otherwise, heaven is closed. And specifically in context, the younger generation, just be very, very careful. Remember I told you last week, a few weeks ago, where David said, if I had spoken thus, I would have betrayed, I would have betrayed a whole generation. And that's very close to my heart. Right? Look at the next verse. Be on your guard. Watch this. If your brother sins, rebuke him. In other words, correct them. Somebody sins, correct them. If they say, sorry, I repent, what must you do? Forgive them. If he sins against you seven times in a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent. You can't say, yo, bro, there's 24 hours. Eh? A day is 24 hours. You've offended me in the same account for seven days. If you do the maths, that's like every three and a half hours you've done this in the 24 hour period. If you take the eight hours sleeping time away, it's about works out to about every two and a half hours. Somebody offends you every two and a half hours. How are you like that? For the same thing the whole day. And the first time you say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You just, no problem. Right? That happened at like eight o'clock in the morning. Half past ten. Same thing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you forgive them, right? Two and a half hours later, um, again, and that goes on and on. Jesus said, some will forgive them. Now, everyone do this. Say, some will forgive them. You can't afford to let unforgiveness settle in your heart. Now, please, I know you have 110 questions, but I've processed the issue of forgiveness in about 17 sessions or so during COVID. It's on the website. If you want to probe deeper, into the issue of forgiveness and bitterness. There's a, there's a playlist on our YouTube called, well, the one is called Forgiveness and the other is called A Bitter Free Living or something. And you can work through the, 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 the mechanics and the details of these things. Yeah, I'm just making broad statements, right? So, seven is perfection. It offends you seven times in one day. This person has mastered, has perfected the art of offending you. Right? He's studied it. He just knows which buttons to press and to, to rile you. Your disposition is, I forgive you. Now, when the, the apostles heard this, that's why they asked the next question. Look at verse 5. The apostles said, Lord, increase our faith. And this is not faith for cars, faith for buildings. It's not gimme, gimme, gimme faith. This is a faith that represents the nature of God in a matter. This is, you need faith to forgive, right? And the Lord said, if you had faith, watch this. If you had faith like a mustard seed, you will say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. You need faith to move mountains and mulberry trees. You need to uproot some stuff. And don't you need faith to pray? You must pray, Jesus said, in Faith, you want to remove things, uproot things. And Jesus said the statement within the context of teaching about forgiveness. You must never ever take a verse out of its context. The context for uprooting trees here is the capacity to perfect forgiveness against the person who has a perfected offending you. All right? Tell someone perfect forgiveness. Toward the person who has perfected offending you. Right? They come seven times, you say, I've mastered forgiveness. I've been prepared for the sevenfold offense in one day. Why? I want to uproot things by faith in my prayer. Right? So you need this, this level of faith. Look at the context of Mark eleven twenty, And we're going to close in a, in a, in a moment. Mark 11:20 says they were passing in the morning and they saw a fig tree withered from the roots up. Everyone say from the roots. Right? Being reminded Jesus said to him, "Rabbi, look, the fig tree." Right? Peter said to him, uh, Peter said to to Jesus, "Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed the previous day has been 
has been withered. And then Jesus said to them, have faith in? You, you can speak like I speak, Jesus is saying. You can curse things from their root and they will happen if you have the requisite faith for it. Then he says, watch this. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. Everyone say, does not doubt in his heart. Right? But believes that the things he's, he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you, everyone say you pray, right? All things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and it will be granted to you. So he's speaking about prayer and he's saying in prayer there must be faith. When you say, Lord, I ask you for this, that you must believe, everyone say believe, and it will be granted to you. Look at the next verse. Then you get this verse. When you stand praying, forgive. Right? So it seems as though unforgiveness is the biggest preventer of faith that needs to be developed within the lives of the people of God. You might not see the correlation. You might not see, you might deem yourself a person of great faith, but I see you harboring unforgiveness. I declare to you, no faith. Or very little faith because faith is developed within the context of a forgiving heart and you need the faith to pray that you believe God will give you the things for which you ask for so unforgiveness erodes faith now let me prove this to you Hebrews 3 verse 9 19 watch this Hebrews 3 verse 19 so that we see they were not able to enter because of unbelief right this is Israel not being able to enter the promised land because of, everyone say unbelief. unbelief. Now let's work. What is unbelief? Unbelief is a lack of faith, not so. You don't believe. And you can't enter into rest because of unbelief. And this unbelief is given a specific character in, in verse 12 of the same passage. Hebrews 3, 12. Take care, brethren lest there be any one of you, watch this, an evil, unbelieving heart. The King James says, a heart, an evil heart of unbelief. This version says, an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So an unbelieving heart, a lack of faith. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says, it's not innocent unbelief. It's not just a lack of faith. There's an evilness at its root. And that evilness is the incapacity to forgive. You're harboring the resentment, the malice, the unforgiveness. Right? And that there's an evilness there. I want you to, to, to make sure that this bears heavily upon us all today. Let's just quickly look at James 3.14. Just on us, the Lord's reminding me of something we all praying for wisdom, not so? Is your wisdom allotment growing? I hope, I hope we're not regressing into foolishness or folly. We must be wise, okay? If you have bitter jealousy, watch this, and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Verse 15. This wisdom, everyone say this wisdom. Bitterness, bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. It's a wisdom which comes not, doesn't come down from above, but it's three things. It's earthly, it's natural, and it's demonic. Now, we don't want that level of wisdom. So that level of wisdom operates in bitterness. So I'm saying to you, if you harbor bitterness, I appeal to you to study my series on bitterness. Get healed from your bitterness. Right? The acridity. It's acrid. It's gnawing. It erodes. It erodes up. It eats away at your soul. There's some people that are going to die bitter. That's a very sad thing for me. You had an opportunity to change, but you're going to go to the grave bitter. Don't die a bitter man. You know, if you're going to grow old, don't grow old bitterly. Right? It's bad enough that you're growing old, but don't be bitter too. Right? <laughs> In other words, I said to the Lord, hey, Lord, when I get bitter, I mustn't be this old. 
what word? <laughs> Old man that no one loves to hang around. Right? right? I'm so glad I have my mother-in-law at home. Right? A bitter free woman. Right? We joke with each other every day when we meet, especially in the kitchen. It's our favorite meeting place. And we have a few private jokes there. Right? But effervescent, joyful, lovely to hang around with. Amen? I often say to you, when I looked at my mother-in-law, I realized I made the right decision to marry my wife. <laughs> when I saw my future, <laughs> I tracked back. <laughs> okay. And I want to encourage you. Some old people are so grumpy. Don't be a Gramps and be a grumpy Gramps. Right? A granny and a grumpy granny. The, the worst thing is to be young and be grumpy. <laughs> Never mind that. Leave that. There are some young people that need joy. Right? Some people are just so sour-faced. They say, if you are happy, inform your face. <laughs> I'm just joking with you. Such someone is joking. Now, some of you will only remember that part of the sermon. <laughs> Get all the scriptures. Oh, the pastor said. <laughs> you know? I want to encourage you um, that unbelief, the Bible calls it an evil heart of unbelief. There's a root to the fact that you've got no faith. It's called evil. That evil is present there in malice, bitterness, um, etc. Here's the verse that I, I told you. Galatians 5, 6 tells us that faith works through love. Latter part, Galatians 5, 6. Everyone say, faith works through love. Amen. So if I need this faith dimension to trust God, it works on the basis of loving God each other, loving everybody. There's a whole bunch of scriptures here. I won't have time to, to uh, go through it. I wrote in my notes, the fearless deeds produced by faith are motivated by a strong desire of love to express itself. I'll say it again. The fearless, everyone say fearless. Fearless deeds of faith. You know, the men of faith did like mighty things. They were bold. They were fearless. The fearless deeds of faith is built upon or motivated by a strong desire of love to express itself. I don't just have faith to show what faith I have. I do things by faith because love drives it. And it says faith works through, faith works through, through love. Right? And you must uh, capture this principle deep within your heart. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now faith, hope, and love. These three. But what is the greatest? But the greatest is love. And if all the accounts in Scripture, whenever Jesus taught on prayer, He said you must have faith to pray. Believe, ask, believe, and you will receive. Have this faith. And if that dynamic is far lesser than the quintessential requirement which is love then I must pursue love so I can work faith everyone say faith works by love faith works by love say it again Galatians 5 6 just put it back faith works by love say it again faith works through love some of your faith is not working because there's no love to express itself the fearless deeds of faith is produced or motivated, strong desire by love to manifest itself. Okay? Do you think God is egotistical? Do you think God got a self-concept problem? Do you think it's got a dented self-image? Anybody? No, it doesn't, right? Do you think if he does something like powerful, like let's say raise a, a, a dead man from the grave, do you think it's motivated by a desire to see how powerful I am? Huh? If that's the case, it would be utter vanity. Because he's all powerful. But his acts are always motivated by his love. The same with you. I, I want to prophesy to you. If you hear what the Lord is saying this morning, many of you are going to pray powerful things and they will be done. Not to showcase your, spiritual, your spirituality, but to find expression to your love. Faith is simply the conduit that love seeks to express itself. Right? So Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 2 says the following. If I have all 
faith so as to remove mountains, the last part. But I do not have love. I am nothing. If Jesus said, your faith can, you say to this mountain, you don't doubt in your heart, you believe. So all the scriptures put together gives us this picture that faith that moves mountains must be motivated by strong desire of love to express itself. Otherwise, we'll be moving unnecessary mountains everywhere. Right? So you can't move, like I said earlier, you can't move the mountain in your path unless you first remove the mountain of unforgiveness in your heart. Many so-called faithful persons want to move mountains externally, but fail to deal with the big mountain of unforgiveness, anger, bitterness within the, within the, within the heart. Okay? You must first, before you can move the tree, Jesus said, if you say to this mulberry tree, be removed. Before you can move the tree, you must first uproot the unforgiveness in your heart. Now, this is very, very serious to me. Right? So, now ask your neighbor this. Let me ask you to ask each other. So, ask your neighbor, so what are you going to do about it? This is not a bless me message. Ooh, feel the gold goosebumps. No, no. This is go home. What are you going to do about it? All right? What are you going to do about this? Job 42 verse 10. Let me end with this. There are many other scriptures. What I'll do is in the note I'll give you, you can read and study in preparation for house church on Wednesday. You can read it at your leisure. But Job 42 and verse 10. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job. When he prayed for his friends. And the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. There were four friends, I think, of Job, three in particular, that gave him wrong counsel in the whole book. A lot of the times they misunderstood him. They thought he had sinned. That's why he's experiencing all these problems. They counseled him wrongly. And then God was about to give back Job all that he lost. The singular thing that God was waiting for to see in Job is his attitude towards his friends. These friends that misunderstood you, these friends that could not see what you were going through, these friends that constantly spoke ill about you. Job, can you pray for them? Can you pray for their breakthrough? And the Bible says, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends and the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. Everyone say twofold. Increased all that Job had twofold. The Lord is simply waiting for some of you before he increases you because you're praying for increase. God is saying, I need to check your attitude to those that have caused offenses in your heart. You know, one of the best ways I find to give expression to the fact that I've truly forgiven someone is when I, if I can pray for them. And I, I really want to sincerely impress this upon your heart. Don't pray for them simply because the Bible says, pray for your enemies. Bless those that hurt you, despitefully use you. Don't just do it because to be spiritually correct, so as you avert divine disaster upon your life. Do it sincerely. Look at that enemy of yours and look at them and say, I'm not loving you because the Bible just says I must do it. I love you because I genuinely mean it. I see you're doing nonsense and, and hurt to me, but I love you, right? I love you. In my forgiveness series, um, I taught something to the effect, you know, they say, forgive the other um, because, so that you don't get divine disfavor, right? So that you set yourself free. Right? Forgive the others so that you release yourself from your own internal prison. You see all these quotes on Facebook, right? all pictures and things. Forgive, your, forgive the other to do a favor for yourself. That's selfish. You must forgive as Christ has forgiven you. And when he forgave you, he had you as the primary focus of his best interest. So when I forgive an enemy, I must look at them with the love of Christ and I must say, I'm not just forgiving you for my sake, 
So I don't get imprisoned. I forgive you for you because I love you. I want to see the best for you. That is when love becomes perfected. Now that person on their knees praying to God, all of heaven opens. Because God says there's nothing in your life. God ranks relational issues extremely highly. It can either block your path or it can open the doors to great and significant blessing. I just feel some of you need to go home. Today, everyone say today. Amen. Don't leave this and don't think too much. Do you hear in God in the service? Just do it. Go home today and put the matter right. You know what I believe very strongly today? There is grace for this today. Right? Don't leave Egypt without Moses. If Moses comes to Israel and says, tonight we are going. Right? And he takes all of Israel and he confronts the Red Sea and they go. If you stayed behind and said, no Moses, give me, I need 21 days to fast about to see whether your decision as a leader is accurate. Give me 21 days. Moses, no problem, stay here. I'm gone. Right? Gone with the rest. And if you decide 21 days later, oh, he was right after all, but he's gone. <laughs> Now I have to deal with the might of Egypt all by myself when grace to leave was present 21 days ago. I'm saying grace to forgive is present now. And what I perceive, grace to reconcile is present now. Act in the moment. Don't defer too long. Act while the word is fresh in your mind. Act while the grace is present. Reconcile and you will see when we come on a Friday morning and this house prays, all of heaven's opened. Because there's nothing in our lives, corporately particularly, that is preventing us from growing to the degree that we should. One last scripture, Ephesians 4.30. I'll close with this. My notes are turned over. Very important verse of scripture. For me, if all the scriptures on forgiveness, which are there are many in the Bible, this for me is my primary go-to. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And you'll see the context here is bitterness and unforgiveness. So how do I grieve the Holy Spirit? Unforgiveness grieves the Holy Spirit. Bitterness grieves the Holy Spirit. By whom you are sealed for the day of redemption, let all bitterness. So bitterness grieves the Holy Spirit. Not some, all. Everyone say all bitterness. And now I'm addressing us, I'm addressing Renee and myself. I don't think there's anybody in the service that can leave and say that person, that someone was for Sherwin. I know my heart, I, God has Sherwin's number. No, this, this sermon is for you. Remind the person, this was designed for you today. This was, and this is for, for Renaina, this was tailor-made for us. We must go back. Let me say, don't speak negatively about anyone from today onwards. How's that? Can we make a deal? <laughs> eh? Some of you are saying, ouch, because I was planning at lunch today. <laughs> no, no. No, I want to encourage you, don't let negative words about anybody leave your mouth. Even, and we got to caution ourselves, even if you reference something of the past, don't seek, even while the issue is past, to re bring up the issue and slur or taint the image of someone that has gone past that issue already. Don't rake up old bones. Leave it and go free. And your prayer will be powerful. Let all bitterness, all wrath and anger. I wish I had time to distinguish, uh, teach the distinction. Two different Greek words, wrath and anger. Sounds similar, but they're not. Clamor, slander. You know how people slander each other's reputations and names? Huh? Be put away from you. Kartatizo, the Greek word, put away. Everyone say kartatizo. Sounds like a karate chop. Say kartatizo. Cut the thing off. Deal. Deal with it. This is not passive. You've got to cartatizo certain things. Just chop the thing right off. Right? Be put away from you along with all malice, ill intent. You want the other one to, feel, uh, to experience some hurt or the other. Verse 32. Be kind. Practice kindness. Can this house practice kindness? I'm going to ask you. Can we be kind? Tell them and say, just be nice. Some of us are so nasty. Just be nice. Practice kindness. Kindness is one of the fruit of the Holy Ghost. 
Even the way you, 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 you meet that beggar that irritates you at the robot. At least greet the man. Don't just fob him off. You ask my family, I'm kind to everybody. Hi, Bruce, sorry, I don't have anything for you today. If I had, I would have given you. But I regard you. I, I honor you as a person. I won't dismiss you and just think nothing of you. Everyone say, be kind to everyone. Okay, your beggars, I'm going to thank God for you from now onwards. Now you're going to be kind. The kindness of the Lord is going to flood, flood, flood your world. Amen. Now this one is very important. Say, say it like, like, it, like you mean. Say, tender-hearted. Not tender, tender. Say, tender-hearted. Because <laughs> the African tender is another <laughs> Something else. Yeah. If you say this in the right context, tender, oh yes, tender, tender. <laughs> say, tender-hearted. Some people are so tough-hearted. What has happened to your tenderness? What has happened to your softness? Why so hard? Why so brutal? Why that opinion so cutting? Right? Why does it lack Christ? Practice tender-hearted. Then he says, now from that context, this is how you can practice forgiving one another. Some people are not forgiving because kindness has left the building. Tenderheartedness is a thing of the past. It's toughness. Forgiving each other just as Christ, God in Christ has forgiven. God in Christ has forgiven you. Okay? Do you know that song of forgiveness you sang? You wrote. Not now. Maybe next week. Or oh, you won't be here next week. Carla wrote an excellent song. When we taught this forgiveness series in COVID, from the content she wrote, remember that song she wrote uh, on forgiveness? Um, powerful song. I'll share it with the church later on the church WhatsApp group. But just practice forgiveness. Hmm? I only have one enemy. Only one. Hmm? It's called the devil. Apart from that, I got no other enemies. All right? can't afford to. They are, from their perspective, my enemy, but from my perspective, the Bible says I must love you, bless you, be kind to you, treat you well, so that I don't grieve the Holy Spirit. My prayers are always answered. Amen. Lift up your hands there where you are. Just lift up your hands. We'll say a quick prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer of impartation. If you need to repent of any unforgiveness, do that now. Because God the Holy Ghost is here. You see, why is the Father speaking to us like this? The Father wants to enhance our prayer. The Father wants to give us an enhanced prayer. We, God wants us to move mountains externally. But we must first move that mountain of resentment, unforgiveness, bitterness in, in our heart. With your eyes closed, forgiveness just takes a decision. That's all. Your pure response to a meeting, a teaching of this nature, is simply a decision. You decide in your heart, I am going to forgive. That's my decision today. I will express it, I will communicate it. I'm going to practice tender heartedness. I'm going to be kind to people. I'm going to be kind to people. I'm going to forgive my greatest enemy. If people curse me, I'm going to bless them. I won't retaliate evil for evil, but I will meet evil with good. Because when I put, lift my hands to heaven, I want an unforgiving heart to fuel my faith because that faith is built on love. And love, faith worketh by love. Right? I can see God has touched many of your hearts today. God has moved powerfully in many respects, in many of your hearts. And I want to encourage you just to release that now. Just to release that in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want you to stand. Song one, two. The worship team can just join me. You know, God loves us. I'm amazed always at His love. We're going to participate of communion in a moment. 
the greatest act of God so loved the world that he forgave he gave his only son who ultimately secured forgiveness for all of us I want you just to think about about God's love just close your eyes and lift your hands think about his love think about his goodness think about his goodness think about his grace think about his brought us through that's brought us through for as high as the heavens above for as high as the heavens above so great is the measure so great is the measure of our Father's love great is the measure About his love. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace. Think about his grace. Brought us through. That's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above. For as high as the heavens above. So great is the measure. So great is the measure. His love. Think about His love. Think about His goodness. Oh, think about His grace that's brought us through. For as high, for as high as the heavens above. Oh yes, so great is the measure. of God, your heavenly Father. His love is able to love through you. His love is able to heal your own hurt. I say to you, church, be healed even now. Be healed of your bitterness. Even that residual thing, it's lurking somewhere, but God is draining back the waters of your ocean and revealing the wreckage down below. God is revealing the wreckage of of anger, bitterness. Maybe you thought you were over things, but every time that trigger happens, you find yourself in a spiral of uncontrolled emotions, uncontrolled responses. God is saying, I want you to have the victory over that. Receive my love. Receive my healing. Receive my forgiveness. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Just be healed, church. Be healed in the name of the Lord. I want everybody with your eyes closed, just release any anger right now any bitterness just forgive anybody that has hurt you anybody that has done evil against you you say in your heart God I forgive him anyone and anything in the name of the Lord I forgive him so that when I pray to you I will be able to move mountains I will be able to move trees God remove the mountain of unforgiveness and hurt and bitterness in my heart in the name of Jesus we receive your healing we receive your healing grace we receive your healing God we receive we receive we receive we receive oh heal me oh Lord and I will be healed
well, our greatest enemies, may they prosper, oh Father. May you bless them. May you help them. May you provide for them. May they excel way beyond us. May your favor just rest upon them. Everyone that has hurt us, everyone that has disappointed us, bless them, oh Father. Come on, I want you to pray this prayer. Pray blessing. Pray blessing upon your greatest enemies. I just believe the Lord is saying today that some of you need to forgive yourself. We're speaking about forgiving the enemies, but I believe God is saying there's some choices you've made in the past. There's some decisions you made and you're going through life saying, if only I didn't do that. If only I didn't say that. If only I didn't think that. And so sometimes the enemy is within and you need to forgive yourself today. There's yes. grace for that. Amen. Yes. Lift your hands to the Lord. A whole teaching on this, you must watch it. I'll share you the link. Forgive yourself before you forgive others. Some of you are too hard on yourself. And you're adopting an unforgiving disposition when God has already forgiven you. Don't let the guilt of the past haunt you eternally. God has forgiven you. The prodigal who came back, he runs toward you, embraces you, kisses you. And he puts his robe on you slaughters the fattened calf celebrates the fact that you you've made a mistake but you've come back come let us return to the lord and he will heal us the bible says let us come to the god of our salvation he will he will restore us god is that way inclined i declare that you are forgiven you are forgiven in the name of the lord i want you just to maybe just go around we I'm not ending the service please don't leave something we need to do um Take your communion elements first. We're going to celebrate the Lord's um, table. Amen. And I want you as you do this celebratory uh, sacrament, the Lord's Supper, that you will receive the grace, not just to be forgiven, but the grace to forgive in the name of the Lord. Receive His body and His blood. Just, just by faith, just say to the persons within your immediate sphere, you are forgiven, you are forgiven, you are forgiven. Come on, tell them you are forgiven. Come on, tell them you are forgiven. Amen. And you may be seated. 
kids can come back from a Sunday school if you want to just maybe someone call them. The matter of um, the message of, of unforgiveness never gets old because offenses never stop. It would be nice if we were living in a world when everyone just likes us, you know. But we're not there yet. So the need to sometimes revisit these kinds of messages are critical. And I just thought it uh, coincidental, not coincidental actually, when God highlights this in the culture of the series we're doing now, I saw the link between the two of how unforgiveness really helps prayer power. I'm going to call two families, um, Owen and your family, and then Salwan and your family, just to introduce them to the house today. Amen. Um, the kids are coming in, so they'll join you here in front. But you guys can come forward. Come, Shalom. Also, sh- should have the Walters here, yeah, but uh, Hayden, just stand for one second. Uh, many of you know Hayden, and Regan was here last week, but he was called away unexpectedly. Um, so they'll we'll introduce him as a family when, when Regan is back. But they've also wanted to take um, t- um, membership, so to speak. Come closer, for just for the sake of the camera. Okay. Well, we want to welcome the Youngs and the Governors to. Uh, be part of Gate Ministries Durban Central. Um, I met someone at the gym. We train together. We, for our gym, our grid workout, we stay next to each other, encourage each other in the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And um, uh, it was a wonderful occasion and privilege to welcome both of you, both families, to be part of this corporate house, this spiritual family. Uh, it's part of the fulfillment of prophecies that God said one by one they will come and in families and so we celebrate you we welcome you into this house Um, be part of this house I know you already are you felt the love you felt the warm the acceptance but formally we want to accept you and embrace you within our hearts this is your family where your father's in Christ but this is your family your brothers and sisters and so you must never feel alone you must never feel isolated. You're part of the house of the Lord in this jurisdiction. Amen. I pray a blessing over you shortly, but I just want maybe each of you just to share a greeting with us and uh, to say hello. And maybe introduce your family formally. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Greet you in the name of the Lord. Uh, this is Yolanda Young, my wife. This is Noel Young, and this is Shiloh Young. Who is peace, and I have a bigger son who is Keelan Young, who's not with us. He, he doesn't live with us, but he visits on occasion. And I am Sa- Salwin Young, the, the father, the patriarch of the house. Eh? I'm, I'm the patriarch of this, this family. So, for many years, I, I feel like I kind of strayed away from that role of being the patriarch, being the spiritual leader within the home, mm. and I never took my family, I I believe Yolanda and I actually started serving the Lord seriously together when we were dating, and then we kind of split for a little, came back together, and God, because he wanted to impart himself into each of us, and then he brought us back together, we were married and served the Lord together faithfully, but somewhere along the line, the, 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 the challenges of life and everything, and parenting, and work, and everything, of studies, just drove us mm. a little bit further and further away from where we were kind of adrift in a wilderness. And I believe that was mainly because me as the spiritual father, I did not stand up and I did not take my place in the home as the, as the priest, the prophet, the provider, and the one who calls the family to prayer. And um, we kind of found ourselves in a, a wilderness for 
uh, quite a long time, for a few years, and, and the Lord kept on calling us out. One of the catalysts, for the, the Lord was calling us out of where we were worshiping, and he was saying, I need to take you to a higher place. But we ignored his voice, and that, that was one of the consequences of us ignoring his voice, was that we never came out, but we never grew. We actually regressed, and we started to realize a lot of challenges and problems in our lives and in our marriage. And um, when, by the time Shiloh came, we realized we need to take this serious. But God was preparing me from the, the death of, of, of uh, Tommy Davis when I heard you speak first. And I asked my wife, who is that man? You know, who is he? he? The way he speaks, he's so eloquent. The way he brings across the word, he was just a man above with stature like Daniel. Like, he's, like, like Pastor always reminds us to be a man of excellence. And when we worked out together in the gym, I never knew that God was preparing me, even moving me from my old gym to this new gym. He was, he was saying that this is now, I need you to go up. This is the place I want you to be. And corporately, as everybody wel welcomed us in, that was one of the reasons we stayed, because we were welcomed so warmly, and everybody welcomed our children. And so we thank you. And it's a big thing to welcome people, make people feel welcome because they want to stay. And the last thing I want to say, Pastor, is from the time we came in, the Spirit of God has been cutting away all of the dead things, and He has been pruning us. He has been dealing with issues within us individually and within us corporately. And so that is why we know that we've been planted in the right vineyard. We've been grafted into this vineyard. And we can feel that we are being pruned. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Amen. Rachel. I have the sports person. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Simla. This is my husband, Owen. Um, married for going on 18 years. Too long. Uh, <laughs> this is my daughter, Alexis. She's 14. And Lakin, who is 9, going on 21. Uh, <laughs> the boss of the family. Um, we've also been um, searching for a new home from around October last year. Um, and coming from an apostolic background, uh, it was very hard to find the same standard that we were used to. Um, we visited a lot of churches, but there was always something missing. And I always felt that uneasiness because um, we prayed about our move, um, but we also felt like we were in the wilderness. Um, and I just sought the Lord and he answered. Uh, my husband and I came to a meeting here, but we had the old um, timing. It was at nine, I think, on the Facebook page. So we came halfway through the service. Um, but even though I came halfway through, I still felt that connection. And when I brought the girls in uh, afterwards, we all had the similar uh, sentiment where you know, something just clicked and resonated within our spirits, um, and we felt like home. It's very difficult to come to a new church where you don't know any familiar faces. You know, it's a daunting thing, but I must say that we felt very, very welcome. Um, I've had the, the fortune of going to the ladies' meeting where I met most of the ladies here, and I felt so welcome. I was also so doubtful uh, whether I should actually go to the meeting because, you know, you don't know anybody there. But my husband said, you know what, don't let fear stand in your way, you know? Uh, just go and give it a try, and I'm so glad that I did. Um, so yeah, we're very excited to build uh, with Pastor Randolph and uh, Pastor Renee, and uh, with uh, each of you here. So thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Would you stretch with your hands towards them? Father, in Jesus' name, we bless our new families. Thank you, Father, for your word that says you set some in the church as it pleases you, and this has pleased you. We ask, oh God, your blessing rest and abide upon them, that you, God, guide, watch over them, that they would grow into the fullness of the image, the stature, and the nature that is Christ's. We bless them now. We celebrate them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Amen. Bless you guys. Amen. Amen. We must create 
uh, structures for growth, like we've been talking at the meet. The caucus, who enjoyed the caucus meeting on Wednesday? It was a powerful, powerful time. If you've missed that, then please listen to the recording. There's many opportunities for you to become engaged in um, and to, to build the house of the Lord um, so that the Word of God can keep growing and the number of disciples, number of families. I believe this edition will grow by families. Right? God is the God of the families of the earth, the Bible says. So if any of you want to become involved in any aspect of the ministry, you want to lend a hand, please consult Jeremy. Um, um, I also, I think we'll just update the document I did, and then we'll resend it out um, to everybody. And if there's an area that, where you can contribute, then please do. But what is primary in my heart is that we create a culture of family. Love, there mustn't be no cliques, no sections. We're all one in Christ. We love each other equally in God. Those things are critical for me. I want to remind you again, uh, the winter is fast approaching, and uh, we have up until the 25th of May to give donations to the Blanket Drive. And um, we're going to call a committee uh, a meeting soon where we can plan exactly how we're going to do this, okay? Um, and so Raylene Hens Umbambano, the, uh, uh, an, initi an initiative that was born in her heart, and we're going to work uh, together. Um, and so if anybody would like to be part of anything that relates to the church in terms of social initiatives, where we help the community and where there's an outreach to help in any regard or to find expression of the love of Christ, like, for example, the warm winter blanket drive. And this is one thing, but as Jeremy said on, Sunday, on Wednesday, this needs to grow. It must go now beyond this. But also the way in which this is done needs to be a bit more effective and a bit more thought behind it, etc. And so we'll be making the order probably in this week um, so that our, our suppliers can get busy with, 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 with this. But if you would like to donate anything in reference to this, if you're sewing into the church account, you must please put the word blanket, your name and blanket, so we can direct these funds for, for this purpose. Amen. Anything else? Amen. Well, enjoy your Sunday. Great grace and abundant peace. Love you all.